Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last day of our APSA virtual technical session. So today you will hear the topics uh, about um, few crops, which um, has been brought to you by standing, uh, I'm sorry, for special interest group of field crop committees. All right, so before we start uh, the agenda today, first I would like to give you a housekeeping rule, all right? So everyone who joined now, uh, you are on mute automatically and you are not allowed to turn on your video camera, all right? So if you have any questions during the presentation, please make sure you put your questions in the Q&A box, okay? Q&A box. So you should see the, the icon say Q&A so that you, that's how you can add the questions. So when you put the question in Q&A boxes would allow all the speakers to see your questions and then they can help to address your questions. Also during the during um, live, he, they can, if you have time, they would address your, uh, your question, all right? If not, they will help to type back the, the answer, okay? And if you have any technical issues, please put your uh, comments in the chat box, okay? So I think that's easy and straightforward, right? So make sure that um, the audio is set and everything is clear and running smooth for you so that um, you can enjoy the most of the session. Okay, so before we start, I would like to thank our sponsor for today's session from Kiban. So before we start, let us see the video from Kiban. Kiban for sponsoring today's session. Next, I would like to invite our chair of special interest group of field crops, Dr. Frisco Malabanan, to share the session. Dr. Frisco, please. Let I am a video. Okay, on. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, participating in this uh, virtual technical session of the special interest group on field crops. Uh, I would like to greet uh, our, my co-chair, uh, Dr. Chua Kim Aik from Malaysia. And then of course, our invited uh, speakers, uh, we have three speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first one uh, uh, speaker uh, will be talking on the uh, fall army worm. Uh, he is Dr. B. Prasana. And then uh, we have another speaker after that. Uh, we have uh, Professor Peng Hai uh, from uh, China. And uh, he will be... Uh, uh, talking on the breeding innovation with biotechnology. And the last speaker will be uh, from uh, CMET, uh, uh, Mr. Michael Queen, uh, who will be talking on the breeding innovation to provide genetic gains to farmers uh, field. So uh, after the presentation of the three speakers, uh, we will be uh, having the presentation of the special interest group on field crops updates on current activities. And I will be introducing the members of the working committee. And then after that, uh, the vice, uh, the co-chair, Dr. Chua will present the summary of our technical uh, session. So uh, we can start our uh, technical uh, session on the special interest group on field crops. Let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, B.M. Prasana. Uh, he is the director of the Global Maize Program from the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center uh, and the uh, CGR Research Program on Maize. 
and he will be talking on the sustainable management of uh, fall armyworm in the Asia Pacific uh, regarding the need for implement, implementing a well-coordinated research and development strategy. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Prasanna to present his paper. Dr. Prasanna, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Fresco, for this introduction. And it's a great pleasure to participate once again in the Asia Pacific Seed Congress. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk uh, this year on this virtual platform. Um, we are, of course, going through a challenging time on multiple fronts. Uh, COVID-19 is uh, one amongst the major ones, but for maize crops in the Asia Pacific, uh, there is another big challenge that is uh, the fall army worm. Uh, and uh, this, this pest is not a new pest. Uh, it has been there for several decades in the Americas, uh, but it uh, entered uh, Africa uh, in 2015, officially reported in January, 2016, uh, then spread very rapidly to more than 40 countries uh, across Africa. And then uh, the pest introduced, uh, uh, the pest came into Asia uh, in May 2018, especially in India, the southern part of India. Then again, there has been a very rapid uh, invasion of uh, the fall armyworm populations across Asia. Uh, and uh, in 2020, February, Australia reported the pest and the most recent country that reported uh, the fall army worm formally uh, is Pakistan uh, in September 2020. Uh, therefore, fall army worm is now a global problem uh, spreading across multiple continents and uh, causing serious concern, uh, not only in Africa, but also in the Asia Pacific. Uh, poly it is a polyphagous pest. We know that there are multiple hosts for uh, fall army worm. But when maize is there, it's a major preferred crop for this pest. And therefore, uh, maize crops suffered seriously uh, in Africa and now since 2018 in uh, Asia. And that affected the food security incomes and livelihoods of millions of smallholders. Uh, lack of adequate awareness of fall armyworm management is still a, a, an important issue. And therefore, many smallholder farmers who do not have access to proper information continue to use toxic, highly toxic pesticides, uh, not only causing ecological and environmental harm, but many a times also to the families of these uh, populations where uh, there, no, there is no proper personal protective equipment. It must be remembered that once introduced into countries in Africa and Asia, it's almost uh, impossible to eradicate this pest. Africa and Asia have conducive environments uh, for the pest to be present almost throughout the year, uh, unlike in the northern part of America, uh, where uh, the typical cold conditions pushes this uh, pest to the downward uh, to the countries uh, uh, in uh, Central America, uh, and also to Texas and Florida. This annual pattern of migration is very well known for this pest. So we must recognize here that we are now actually running a marathon uh, and not a 100 meter sprint in terms of uh, uh, management of fall armyworm. Uh, the fall armyworm has two different strains. There is something called the C strain or corn strain, which typically affects uh, uh, what we call maize and millets. And there is supposed to be an R strain or a rice strain, uh, which has particular preference for uh, rice and millets, especially rice. Uh, is there a fall armyworm rice strain in Asia? Uh, this is an important question because many countries in Asia uh, have huge dependence on rice. Uh, but a recent publication from uh, Rod Nagoshi, uh, who is at uh, USDA in Florida, uh, together with uh, several colleagues from Asia uh, and the paper published in 2020, uh, this study uh, utilized genetic markers to compare fall armyworm populations in Myanmar, and southern China, uh, together with those populations in Africa and India. And it conclusively proves that there is a common origin, perhaps a single introduction into Asia, 
uh, and the further spread uh, of these populations. There is no evidence so far of a rice strain uh, with preference for rice and millets, but uh, we must be very careful in drawing uh, a strong conclusion the rice strain may not happen. Uh, there is no reason for complacency. And if it indeed happens, it, could, it, will, uh, uh, it will significantly enlarge our concern. Uh, how can we, we all know that there is no single solution to the fall amoebum. Uh, therefore, the critical question is how can we ensure that the best science-based solutions are available to the farmers? Uh, we need to certainly adopt a good agronomic ma management practices and together with uh, integrated pest management and revolving around through three fundamental aspects, knowledge, uh, tools, and policies. Uh, we need to help farmers and ag specialists access best science-based knowledge for fall amoeba management, develop and validate and deploy the best tools, whether they come from public sector or from the private sector, and uh, create enabling environment, especially policies uh, that ensure access to and safe use of various management options. So the four most important criteria here are efficacy of a uh, technological intervention, the affordability of this, uh, especially to the smallholder farmers, access to the technology at the right time, and the safety, of course, is uh, critical. Uh, so these are, and scalability, of course, is uh, another major aspect that we need to look into. Uh, over the last few years, CIMIT, as well as several partners, uh, in the Asia Pacific have focused on developing various communication resources uh, and propagating them very widely um, in both Africa as well as in Asia. For example, uh, simple tools like uh, leaflets with the pictorial depiction of various stages of polymer bomb. When can it affect maize? And how do we control this? Uh, these have been developed in countries like Bangladesh. Similarly, in collaboration with Michigan State University, uh, we developed a video, a scientific animation without borders, a Sabo video uh, on how to identify and scout for fall amoeba. Uh, this video has been translated into more than uh, 40 languages in uh, Africa and Asia and very widely uh, disseminated. There are also fall amoeba monitoring uh, uh, tools as well as the FAMUS is an application by FAO uh, and re very recently, CABI, together with CIMIT and many institutions, have also started a Fala Miwam research collaboration portal uh, to update the community about various uh, uh, aspects related to uh, Fala Miwam management. On the biological control front, uh, certainly this is an important component of integrated pest management. More than 150 parasitoids from uh, 14 different insect families have been identified uh, to, uh, in so far uh, from various continents. Uh, these also include uh, uh, baculoviruses, entomopathogenic fungi, and nematodes. Uh, so intensive work on natural enemies of fall uh, is presently being undertaken by several institutions, both in Africa as well as in Asia. Uh, however, most countries are adopting conservation biological control. Uh, there are not many instances where we saw so far augmentative releases of parasitoids or predators uh, against uh, fall amoebaum, uh, but that is, that is something that can happen uh, in, in very soon. Uh, biopesticide and botanicals, again, a range of microbial biopesticides, including uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Metarhizium riley, Buvaria bassiana, uh, Spodoptera frugipada, multiple nucleopolyhedroviruses or baculoviruses. Uh, these are all being tested, uh, validated. And uh, in some countries, for example, uh, in Africa, uh, in South Sudan, it has been now registered. Uh, recently, again, in Bangladesh, uh, Foligen, a baculovirus-based biopesticides has been registered. So countries are making progress uh, in terms of testing, validating, and registering some of these options, uh, especially, for example, baculoviruses. So these uh, bot by botanicals and biopesticides have low impact on non-target insects. They have low toxicity to humans and the resistance evolution is less likely. However, uh, there are a number of countries uh, which have not yet adopted very widely biopesticides. Uh, there is a good publication recently uh, from Africa 
especially in Kenya, uh, analyzing the factors behind uh, uh, the reason for why smallholder farmers are not adopting uh, more and more of biopesticides. Uh, this uh, Constantin and coworkers, they highlight that the key to increasing smallholder uptake of biopesticides is to address the farmer's perception of effectiveness. So there are four different areas, the supply side, the demand side, the cost side, and the efficacy side. Where these are the constraints in the use of biopesticides, um, but there are potential solutions. Uh, we need to harmonize the registration procedures uh, for uh, most effective biopesticides across the Asia Pacific, uh, strengthen the local capacity uh, of uh, production as well as supply chain management, formulate smart uh, biopesticides, uh, and undertake extensive demonstrations uh, of uh, uh, effic most efficacious biopesticides, increasing uh, farmers' awareness about them. Uh, so these four key aspects need to be uh, critically, critically taken care of in the next few years. On the host plant resistance front, this is one of the key pillars of uh, integrated pest management, including uh, the fall armyworm. Uh, breeding for resistance, insect resistance, especially the native genetic resistance to various insect pests in maize. Uh, uh, this is more than four decades old now uh, at CIMIT. Uh, excellent publications have come up on insect resistant maize. Uh, for example, John Mim, uh, one of the entomologists who passed away in, uh, last year after retirement um, several years back, uh, he published uh, these uh, excellent publications, Proceedings of a Workshop on Insect Resistant Maze, uh, particularly highlighting uh, the, the presence of insect resistance in some of the land races from Caribbean germplasm as well as Tuxpanos in Mexico. So there is work on native genetic resistance. And the, another most important option is the transgenic resistance, uh, where we use a gene from an external source. Uh, that can make the plant resistant to that particular uh, insect pest. On the native genetic resistance front, uh, CIMIT uh, has established uh, uh, a very strong facility at Kibako in Kenya. Uh, we have now about 13 such greenhouses. Uh, what you see here, uh, each one is uh, uh, one fourth of an acre in terms of size. So it's a huge greenhouse which can uh, test hundreds of entries under replicated conditions uh, under, under, and under artificial infestation, where each plant is challenged with the uh, neonatal larvae of falamivam, which are mass reared in the laboratory. We can't do this obviously in open field conditions uh, because it will create a lot of uh, insect pest pressure. Uh, so using these uh, screen houses, uh, a well-defined mass rearing protocol and a well-defined germplasm screening procedure, we are uh, since last five crop seasons, at Kenya, uh, we have been intensively screening cement germplasm and rate each of this uh, germplasm entry, uh, not only for the foliar damage on a one to nine scale, one being highly resistant and nine being almost dead due to the attack. And not only the foliar damage, but also the ear damage uh, because fall armyworm, there could be multiple populations within a cropping season. And, and it can also affect the reproductive stage by boring into the ears and causing damage to the developing kernels. So we need to look into the foliar damage as well as ear damage. Uh, in the last five crop seasons, more than 6,000 uh, cement maize germplasm entries, including those identified previously in 1980s and 90s, the multiple insect resistance tropical populations, the multiple borer resistant populations, and the lines derived from them have been screened at our facility in Kibako in Kenya. And uh, we now have identified a set of uh, and validated a set of lines, uh, cement maize lines with native genetic resistance to fall amoeba. And these lines have been extensively provided to partners across both Africa and Asia. So any public or private se sector institution which would like to have access to this uh, cement maize lines with native genetic resistance could uh, indeed source them from uh, cement maize program. Uh, so this is one product that has already happened, but these are just inbred lines. But what about uh, ready hybrids that we can launch? So we then did uh, an area of experiments, uh, intensively validating 
several hybrid combinations together with commercial susceptible checks and initially under choice experiments. And then we took a validated set of hybrids and each screen house hosted one particular hybrid. So it is called a no choice experiment uh, where the insect has no other option. Either you feed on it or you die or you perish. Uh, so if you look at this uh, susceptible hybrid, you can see extensive damage caused to the maize plants uh, in that screen house under, under artificial infestation. And uh, a native genetic resistant cement hybrid showing excellent performance even under that no choice experiment. Then we also simultaneously did on-farm trials, this time under high insect pressure, not under artificial infestation, but at multiple locations within Kenya uh, in 2020. And uh, so this again shows, again, in the same trial, how a susceptible hybrid uh, performs versus uh, a tolerant or a native genetic resistant hybrid. So the good news, friends, is that the first generation fall armyworm tolerant elite hybrids from CIMIT will be announced to partners in Africa in the last quarter of 2020. Uh, based on the analysis of this on station and on farm data and after our stage gate advancement meeting in December. And these of course are white maize hybrids because Africa prefers uh, mostly the white maize. Uh, but we can use them as materials again to introduce into Africa, uh, into Asia Pacific and again develop lines and hybrids with uh, excellent resistance to this. Uh, this again requires investment from the donor agencies, but there is there are therefore two options. One, the BT maize with transgenic resistance. The another is uh, the resistance offered by these uh, native genetic resistant hybrids. BT maize against fall armyworm is again a very widely used tool in the US, in Brazil, in many countries, and have provided excellent protection against multiple insect pests, including fall armyworm. Uh, in Philippines, BT maize has been since uh, there in, uh, since 2003, much before uh, fall armyworm came into Asia. And the several events which are suitable against uh, fall armyworm are already there uh, and released by different uh, companies. Uh, Vietnam, again, has a BT maize commercial cultivation since 2015. So these two countries are, again, torch bearers in terms of offering options in terms uh, to the farmers uh, uh, through the host plant resistance already. Uh, and we are hearing very good reports about their performance uh, in these countries. But I would like to emphasize here, the native genetic resistance and the BT based resistance are complementary. Uh, BT maize resistance is typically single gene events or at the most two gene events uh, and they are deployed in Africa and Asia as uh, Africa in South Africa is the only country which has got uh, Monate 9034, an event which is particularly suited against fall armyworm. But these uh, events typically exert high selection pressure on the insect because this is oligogenic and highly uh, produced within the plant. And therefore resistance evolution uh, is more likely. It can happen uh, eventually. But on the other hand, the native genetic resistance is typically polygenic. Uh, it's partial resistance. On a one to nine scale, it will be somewhere between three to five, unlike uh, BT maize, which is one or two or at the most uh, uh, three. Uh, and therefore, this partial resistance is very important as it offers a more sustainable control and possibly different modes of action. I won't go into that. So therefore, if I have to introduce BT maize, uh, the transgenes, uh, I would typically would like to introduce in uh, conventional native genetic resistant background with other relevant defensive and agronomic traits uh, that are suitable for Asia Pacific smallholder farmer farming context. Um, so the next most important thing, wherever BT maize has been introduced or even not introduced, we also need to monitor insecticide resistance in the fall armyworm populations. Uh, a series of publications have come up uh, in Americas and more recently uh, there has been a study in 2020 on genetic structure and insecticide resistance characteristics of fall armyworm populations invading uh, China. Uh, so 
these studies are now beginning to come up in terms of trying to understand what these populations, which are already there in Asia, have in terms of insecticide resistance. Uh, and that, those studies are really important. We need to keep a close watch on, on uh, monitoring resistance in fall armyworm populations, as it, have, it will have not just national level implications, but also sub-regional and continental implications. Understanding the fall armyworm population dynamics, uh, there are papers that are beginning to be published in this area, uh, especially from China. You can see here uh, how uh, modeling as well as uh, uh, institute data is helping researchers to understand how the fall armyworm populations will typically flow uh, in autumn or in winter or in spring or summer. Uh, so this kind of an understanding of the dynamics of fall armyworm populations uh, is also equally important to have uh, suitable interventions planned uh, and uh, implemented. So uh, friends, uh, this is a pest that defies geographies, can sp spread fast within a cropping season. Uh, there is no single solution that can provide a sustainable control, but and no single organization that has all the solutions. So international research for development collaboration, including public private partnerships, are as important as country level research efforts. We need to look at this in a more holistic way. And that's the reason why in, uh, in 2018, we established a, a Fall Army Bomb Research for Development International Consortium, bringing together more than 45 institutions uh, which have got IPM expertise and uh, capacity to work on various aspects of Fall Army Bomb control. And that kind of an effort, including public and private sector institutions, has to be now intensified across Asia Pacific. Uh, if we have to protect the seed security as well as uh, the income security and the livelihood security of millions of smallholder farmers, uh, this I call it as a collaboration imperative. Uh, there is no way any single organization or country can tackle this challenge uh, alone. So, in summary, uh, the fall armyworm humbles us all. Uh, it also tells us that integrated pest management or IPM is also about integrating people's mindsets. Uh, we need to think beyond our narrow boundaries if we have to sustainably manage this pest. We need to have effective, practical, affordable, and scalable tools and management practices based on robust science and evidence. r for d is indeed key for developing and deploying sustainable solutions for fall armyworm management, not only in the short term, uh, but also in the medium and long term. And behind all these efforts, we also need to recognize that the responses has to be, have to be well coordinated uh, at the national level, at the sub-regional level, as well as at the continental levels, constantly learning from uh, the experiences and the expertise of, of uh, countries and institutions. Uh, in my perspective, these are the strategic priorities. We need to intensify farmers and extension agents education on IPM-based fall armyworm control. Intensify, intensify again research for development to develop, validate, and deploy a locally and regionally effective and affordable and scalable technologies and management practices. We need to think of how to uh, design and implement IPM-based management packages that are relevant for the diverse agroecologies, the socioeconomic context uh, of the farming communities, and the maize value chains as such uh, in the Asia Pacific. Maize is used in multiple ways uh, in Asia, and uh, there is no single use. It is used as food, it is used as feed, it's used for various industrial uses, it's used uh, for uh, specialty corn purposes, and we need to think about how to develop relevant packages based on those contexts. Um, and wherever we have opportunities to uh, put together a set of practices, we need to demonstrate them uh, extensively uh, in those target countries. Public-private partnerships uh, are really critical for scaling the science-based solutions. And as I mentioned before, uh, also to have resistance monitoring in far populations and there are still challenges with regard to enabling environment or policies, especially in, in deploying some of the most potent solutions in Asia. 
Uh, so wherever applicable, we need to address this by educating the policymakers, by making them aware that we are losing an opportunity if these technologies are not effectively and immediately deployed. So accelerated access to proven technologies, especially environmentally safer uh, pesticides, uh, biological control agents, biopesticides, host plant resistance uh, for the benefit of smallholder farmers. I thank the global partners uh, who work very intensively, uh, have been working on the follow me on research for development, funding agencies, especially USAID, Feed the Future program, the May CRP, window one, window two donors, and uh, my colleagues at CIMIT for their commitment to the mission. Uh, thank you so much for your hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasanna. I think uh, this is very good presentation. So may I invite back Dr. Fisco to guide a question? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Prasanna, I have one question for you. Sure. Yeah, uh, regarding the accessibility of the corn uh, varieties in CMET uh, for breeding purposes with uh, some resistance to FAW. How can, say, Philippines access that uh, lines? Those lines can be easily accessed. Uh, for example, we have a, uh, we, we have around eight to ten CMET maize lines right now, uh, but of course several more are under validation. Uh, the coded lines. But the immediately available lines are what I displayed in the presentation, like CML 71, uh, 334, 338, and so on. Uh, you just need to send me an email. My email ID is in the first slide, b.m.prasanna at cgr.org. And the seed of those lines uh, can be obtained from our uh, CIMIT headquarters in Mexico without any issue. It will be provided under standard material. Is it free? Oh yeah, yeah, no, no charge at all. We are a non-profit organization. <laughs> but how about how about if the private sector will be the one requesting? No problem. It is available to any partner, any institution, anywhere in the world, both public. No and public. signing of material no, transfer. No, no, no. Just there is a there is a standard material transfer agreement, uh, which is uh, for CGR intellectual property. This thing which goes to with every shipment. Once you accept the shipment, that means you accept this SMTA. What is the what is the amount of seeds that can be requested? Uh, we we stand with the standard number of kernels we provide is 50 seeds per line. Okay. Then you can you. then yeah. you can multiply the seed and then use it in breeding programs. I think this is very interesting uh, point of view for APSA. So, um, Dr. Basana, we like I would get back to you to get more information so that we can share to our member because I think sure. like based on the question from Dr. Frisco is open up, you know, I think more questions also to our members and this is very good news that they can access to the line. I think we have one question in the Q&A box, uh, well now two actually. The first one is have you also tested seed tre treatment solutions? Yeah, seed treatments we have not tested per se, but uh, uh, there is Syngenta, which has done that, uh, seed care. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a commercial product called Fortanzo Duo. Uh, there is a Cotevas product. Um, and there are, there are systemic insecticides which could be, uh, which they have been registered by these companies, which can be coated onto the seed and they offer typically protection uh, in the, for the first three weeks of uh, the crop growth after sowing. And after that, of course, you need to supplement through other interventions. But the initial phase of crop growth is really critical. Uh, at the early stages are particularly vulnerable. So uh, seed treatment is certainly already worked out uh, very strongly by some of these companies and the products are available uh, in countries. I don't know about the exact registration status of these products, but I'm sure that they are available in many countries in Asia Pacific. Yeah, very good. Uh, the next last question is, is there any resistant materials of cement uh, in yellow corn tropical? Yeah, some of the, for example, the lines which I talked about like CML 71, uh, the, it is an yellow line. 
So it, the, the lines that I mentioned, the, the inbred lines with resistance, some of them are yellow, some of them are white. Uh, but remember that these lines are typically coming from Cuban germplasm or taxpanos in Mexico, and they may not be agronomically elite, but they serve as excellent trade donors uh, in the breeding programs. And for you to transfer resistance from those lines, whether it is yellow or white, uh, into your breeding material. So yes, there are both yellow and white lines. That's great. I think that's why I think we need to discuss more on this and uh, definitely we will bring more information back to our members, especially I myself very interested on the Paul Army Worm a resource for development international consortium program. So perhaps you can elaborate more um, in the our magazine or in our communication. Sure, sure, definitely, Thank definitely. You, all right, uh, so I uh, invite back again Dr. Frisco to guide uh, the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prasanna, for a very nice uh, technical presentation. Our uh, second uh, speaker uh, is uh, Professor uh, Peng Hai. He is the director of the Joint Molecular Biology Laboratory Development, uh, Development Center for Science and Technology, Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Rural Affairs, or MARA, and uh, in uh, Jinghan University. So he'll be discussing on the identified standard SSR marker. Uh, this is related to the breeding program uh, of course, uh, like like hybrid rice. So let's uh, welcome Professor uh, Peng Hai from uh, China. Uh, professor. Uh, I cannot open the camera because the host had uh, prohibited me to open the camera. Okay, okay. 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 Hello, everybody. I'm glad. I'm very glad to have the chance to introduce my work to to you. The title of my presentation is MMP Marker and its Applications. Our main work is about the plant identification using DNA markers. MMP marker is a kind of DNA markers, and it is invented by us. At first, uh, let's say the limitations of the existing DNA marker methods. There are two kinds of DNA marker methods, SSR marker methods and SMP marker methods. For plant variety identification, SSR marker methods is the main type of DNA markers. This is a typical geoelectrophorous figures of SSR marker. We cannot know this band is from the is wrong or right because it can be from the experimental error or it comes from the from the impurity states. So this is what this kind of error is very common. It's, it is about 70%. Uh, it can cause about 70% error. Another problem for SSR marker is uh, its digitalization. We cannot know the exact molecular weight. Therefore, it is difficult to digitalize, accurate digitalize uh, this figure. And then it is difficult to get a software, software to deal with this figure. And then when we have low uh, software, it is uh, uh, very difficult for the people to uh, use SSS marker method. You have to have professional person to read these figures and uh, 
you know, use this method. This is the industrial standards of SSR mark method. The main problem is uh, there are two main problems. The first is it is required uh, the set priority. When the set priority is not good, there are many errors in it. Uh, therefore, it uh, required uh, the set to be pure. However, some states will be artificially added by some other uh, kind of varieties sets. So it is difficult to identify that kind of artificial mixture. Another kind of mixture is from the natural sets, such as the rip sets. The rip sets, uh, the purity of rip sets is uh, generally not very good. The second uh, uh, problem for SSR marker is the limited markers used. Generally, it is uh, uh, only about uh, 20 to, four, uh, to 50 markers used for the plant variety identification in the industrial uh, standards. Therefore, the dispute of court judgment often arise because of the limited markers used. Another thing is, for the essential derived variety identification, we often needed a large number of markers. Therefore, SSR marker method cannot be used for the essential derived variety identification. The most serious problem for SSR markers is, uh, is that the accurate identification using SSR markers require the experiment of the variety on the test with the standard samples. However, the standard samples are, are very difficult to obtain for common uh, state companies because the standard samples are often stored by are, are often uh, stored in the government by the government or authorities. For some other kind of identification, such as the seminar variety screening or the infringed variety screening or the essential disorder variety screening, there needs a large number of standard samples. It is very difficult for anybody to take out the, the, to a large number of standard samples from the government. So uh, the state company cannot protect the world right because, uh, because they cannot obtain the standard uh, samples. Another, uh, another DNA markers is the SMP markers. For SMP marker, there are only two uh, alleles. Therefore, when we have four varieties, a single SMP marker cannot distinguish them. Another problem for uh, SMP marker is that the error rate is uh, also high. For example, it can be uh, the accuracy can uh, can be ninety seven percent, and for the hybrid, it can be even it can be even ninety four percent. So it is difficult to be used in the industrial standards. To date, there's only uh, only rice used SMP as in the industrial standards. Its main problem is also have two problems. The first one is the requirements for purity. Uh, it is the same as SSR markers. So I skip this uh, problem. A uh, second problem is that the SMP markers uh, use the microarray to a genotype for genotyping. However, for microarray, it is very difficult to add any SMP uh, markers to the microarray since it had to be designed. So the flexibility is a problem. Let's say our technique uh, 
inventions. But first, uh, we invented the MMP marker. What is a MMP marker? It is, uh, it is referred to a DNA fragment, which is less than 300 base pair. In this DNA fragment, there are several uh, SMP markers. Uh, for example, here, there are one, two, three SMP markers. So this is a MMP markers. M, M is multiple. So it is very similar to SMP. The S become M. S represent a single. How we detect the MMP marker? The method to detect the MMP marker are named as MMP marker method. But first, uh, we were designed 300 to 1,000 MMP markers for a plant species such as rice. For example, for rice, we designed more than one MMP markers. Then we were put those MMP markers together and make a multiplex PCR to amplify all the designed MMP markers. And then the designed MMP markers will be detected by next sequencing generation, uh, next sequencing uh, technology. And the obtained reads will be used to call for the MMP alleles. The advantage uh, the MMP marker method has many advantages. At first, it is high efficient. For the DNA identification, there are two stages. The first stage is PCR amplification and the second stage is PCR production detection. Uh, for the first uh, uh, stage, our method, our MMP marker method, can detect the 300 to 1,000 markers in a single PCR reaction. However, for the SSR marker method, it can only detect one to 10 markers in a single PCR uh, reaction. Therefore, there are uh, 30 to 1,000 uh, fields uh, increasing for the uh, efficiency. And uh, for the PCR product detection, our MMP marker method can, uh, uh, because we use high throughput sequencing technology, therefore, in the stage of PCR uh, production detection, our MMP marker method can detect uh, 1,000 to 1 million marker markers once, but for SSR marker method, it can only detect 1 to 10 markers once. So, there are 10,000 fields. Uh, uh, the, the, the efficiency has been increased for 10,000 uh, fields. For example, uh, we, in our lab, we uh, a person can identify over 1,000 markers uh, of 600 uh, rice cultivars in 10 days and compare the, uh, the DNA fingerprints with 30,000 cultivars in the DNA fingerprints database. For the accuracy, as we know, the sequence is the best way to, de to detect any markers. We use the uh, high support sequencing technology and uh, sequencing each MMP markers for over five, 500 times. So theoretically, the accuracy is very high. Another problem, uh, another advantage for the uh, accuracy is that, for example, uh, for variety one, its MMP audio is AAA, and for variety two, it's CCC. If A, were mistakenly genotyped as, as say, 
for SMP, it can be genotyped, uh, it, it can be mistakenly genotyped as C. If the error rate is 1%, then the AAA becomes CCC. The error rate can become can be decreased can be decreased for uh, decreased to one one percent multiply one percent multiply one percent. Therefore, <coughs> the error rate had to be decreased for ten thousand fields. The actual actual accuracy has been obtained by the following experiment. In the following experiment, we have tested two species, rice and cotton. Rice is a deployed plant. Uh, it is easy to obtain uh, an accurate uh, uh, result. And the cotton is a polyploid species. So it is difficult to get, the, get, uh, get an accurate result. We had a one date. Uh, about uh, 3,000, uh, 30,000 uh, uh, MMP markers by reproducibility uh, experiments. That is, that is to say, we tested uh, the same MMP markers at two labs, at two different labs, at different uh, times, and, uh, uh, and performed by different uh, persons. Uh, using different uh, re, uh, reagents and uh, different uh, instruments. If the, if the genotypes from the two, uh, two labs is identical, very synchronous, the results in the two labs are both right. Otherwise, one of them are wrong. Through so this way, we identified, uh, we, we, get the, uh, we, get, we get the right, uh, uh, the accuracy, and the accuracy of rice is over 90, 90, 99 percent. And the cotton, the accuracy for cotton is uh, over 90, 98 percent. The accuracy is very high. Most important is that, the accuracy is obtained from the results of two different labs. Therefore, we, there's no need for one person to get the standard samples anymore. I can check the standard sample and get its DNA fingerprints and store it in the DNA fingerprint database. Then when you identify this variety, you can use MMP mark method and get the DNA fingerprints also and compared to the DNA fingerprints in my database. So there is no need for the standard samples. We only need the standard samples uh, DNA fingerprints. It is just a data, not a real sample. So we can Every said company can use MMP mark method to protect their own plant varieties right. This is a great advantages. And uh, for, uh, for the EDA identification or infringed variety identification or similar variety identification, we can compare the, the DNA fingerprints of the variety and the test with all the DNA fingerprints in the database. Therefore, there is no need for, uh, for us to take out thousands of standard samples from the government. So this kind of identifications can also be um, accurately identified. Another uh, advantages for MMP mark method is its uh, polymorphism. For SMP, there are only two alleles, but for uh, MMP ha having seven SMPs, there are eight MMP alleles, such as AAA, AAC, and CCC. So use only one MMP markers, it can distinguish 
it uh, four kinds of uh, uh, four kinds of varieties and even more. The actual polymorphism SSR marker is the uh, has the highest polymorphism uh, to date. We compared uh, the MMP uh, the polymorphism MMP markers with the SSR markers. We had tested uh, 1,500 rest varieties and found that for SSR markers, averagingly you know, they are 5.5 .5 alleles for each SSR marker. But for MMP markers, they are 66 alleles for each MMP marker. So the polymorphism had been increased for about 20%. Because of because the MMP marker has a high polymorphism, so it can distinguish the variety very clearly. We have checked the three, three million pairs of rice varieties uh, and found that, and each rice variety had checked for more than 1,000 uh, 1, MMP markers and found that over over 42% is distinct between the two varieties. That means, that, that is to say, about uh, over 400 markers are distinct between the two varieties. So the two varieties can be distinguished very, very well, even it is very similar. This is Cohen. Uh, for Cohen, it can be uh, distinguished uh, also very well. And uh, for the 1,000 uh, 1, uh, marker, MMP markers, they are about four, uh, they are averagingly 700 markers to be distinguished between them. This is Nangan, a uh, wood. This is cotton, a uh, poly -poly, uh, polypoloid uh, plant species. For cotton, the SSR marker, the polymorphism of uh, cotton is not high. So it is very difficult to di distinguish, distinguish them uh, from each other. But uh, use, uh, using MMP markers, uh, they are about, uh, they are over 400 markers to be distinguished. So they, you know, they are, can be uh, distinguished very clearly. And uh, this is wormwood. Wormwood, uh, uh, there is no, no reference genome for wormwood and uh, no any other uh, genetic information for wormwood. We can also develop mental MMP marker methods for wormwood. We have uh, 62 authorized patterns uh, about uh, MMP markers to detect uh, the plant variety <coughs> and uh, the whole human being or animal and the microorganism. We have published a paper um, applications of MMP marker method. For the state law uh, in China, there are over 100 points in state law clauses, which implications require the DNA identification method. At first, uh, we developed the MMP marker method for 34 kinds of plant species. Each uh, species, we develop the uh, 300 to 1,000 MMP markers, and the detection rates were over 95%, and the detection accuracy were all over 99.9%. It is uh, very high. Uh, compared to SSR markers and SMP markers. Then we published uh, national standards for world DNA identification. It is the first national standards for identification of multiple, that is to say 16 plant species. It is the first national standards for the identification of essential desired varieties. And using these standards, the DNA fingerprints can be co-constructed uh, 
contracted and shared between among all the said companies and the government. And there's, no, there's little dependence on standard variety. And uh, we can also eliminate using this uh, standard uh, standards standard. We can also eliminate the aerosol pollution. And therefore, this standard can be implemented by order learning operator in order learning level. Then we established MMP fingerprints database of authorized varieties. In this database contains MMP fingerprints of over 10,000 rice and maize varieties. This is the foundations of plant rights protection. And uh, using this uh, uh, standards, we also uh, use the it. We also used this uh, standard uh, for the authorization prospection judgment of a variety. When a uh, when a variety is uh, uh, breeding, and we want to know if it is can be authorized. That is uh, uh, to say. We want to know if it is distinct from all the varieties in the database, uh, because we have uh, built the database using MMP standards. So we can we can judge the authorized authorization prospect of any varieties in breeding. And the variety authorization authorization review, we can. Uh, accurately screening the screening the seminar uh, varieties of the variety under test, and uh, for the variety uh, which has no distinct uh, markers with the variety in the database, uh, the observation will be rejected. Otherwise, if it has very obviously distinct. Uh, 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 markers, for example, over 10% markers to be distinguished with any one of the uh, DNA fingerprint in the database. It can be uh, authorized, uh, it is recommended to be authorized uh, immediately. Um, we also use the our MMP mark method for the screening of the uh, counterfeits and uh, your protector will rather uh, uh, protect the rather rights. Uh, in 40 days, within 40 days, uh, this year uh, on the April uh, 25, we have identified, uh, we identified uh, over 1,100 rice and maize variety samples for the uh, full base uh, management station. And as a result, and this result uh, is consistent with the result from SSR mark method. SSR mark method is not performed by us, it's performed by the full based management station. So uh, our method had passed through the class uh, validation. And this is a story about state quality control for adult region. A company uh, in Fubei province want to export their seeds to Pakistan. And uh, they did not produce this, their seeds and uh, asked some other companies to produce this, their seeds. Uh, we have checked their, uh, their samples and found that some seeds had to be added, had to be mixed, had a, uh, was a mixture of two varieties. That means that's to say it is uh, an adult racing state. And this is a, a quality control for rice counterfeit and uh, adult racing. Some big pan companies are afraid of buying fake or, or adulted rice and damaged their bonds. Therefore, they will send, uh, they will send their uh, seeds to us for chicken if it is the variety they wanted, or it is the, uh, the mixture of the, uh, the variety they wanted, or 
with other varieties. Identification for the essential derived varieties. We published the first uh, national standards and the seven techniques of special uh, uh, at for the uh, to identify the essential derived varieties. And the uh, one technical specification was included in the white paper uh, in China in 19, in 2019. Well, at last, we want to introduce our national standards for GMO testing. This, this GMO uh, testing national stand, standards has many breakthroughs. The first one is that it can test uh, GMO ingredients for all plants, all plants at one time. And the second uh, is that it can detect all lower GMO elements and uh, the events about the lower GMO, uh, GMO elements at one time. And it can completely avoid the micro, microbial contamination and also pollution. Therefore, it can be carried out in all the learning, in all the learning laboratories. Uh, and uh, there is no need for extensive expense expense and uh, can be implemented by all the learning operators. Mm, this is my this is my pretension. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Peng Hai. I think this is very breakthrough technology and that you have presented. Uh, I again would like to invite back our chair, Dr. Fisco, to guide the patient. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Peng Hai, for your uh, very technical presentation, highly technical presentation. Uh, do we have any questions at the chat box? No. No, we don't have. Uh, don't have. Uh, Dr. Peng, uh, can I ask one question? Okay. Yeah, related to your uh, uh, national standard for GMO testing. Uh, is that technology uh, can be accessed by other country like Philippines? Because Philippines is one of the countries that is using BT or GMO corn as well as Vietnam. So we don't have a national standard for GMO testing for GMO seed testing. So how can we access that technology from you? I can, uh, it can be accessed by anyone in the world because it had been published uh, uh, by our country and it can be used by anyone. I think it can be used by anyone. So, so what will be the, what will be the, pro, the process? I mean, how are we going to start uh, uh, linking with you as to this uh, GMO testing. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I cannot understand, understand this uh, question. Uh, Dr. May? Um, maybe you can uh, type in the message box and, and I will uh, answer your question later because my hearing uh, I cannot, uh, sometimes I cannot understand my, her because of my problem, I, sometimes I cannot understand uh, the question because of my hearing ability. Sometimes I cannot understand the question. So I think you can uh, type your uh, problems in the uh, messenger box and I will answer your question later. Okay, no problem. I will send you the communication uh, regarding this uh, aspect of GMO seed testing. Dr. May, uh, 
there is no question. I, I, I know, I know you have many, many, uh, you have many, many questions about this technology. Uh, for example, how you can, how we can uh, check uh, for any uh, plants and any GMO events. And how can we avoid the microbe uh, pollution? I, I know you, you have many problems, and uh, I think uh, uh, we can, I can, uh, you can, uh, uh, I can answer your question later uh, by the word instead of um, uh, by speech. Uh. Yeah, maybe Dr. Peng, uh, maybe through APSA, through uh, Dr. May. Uh, can I request, uh, say for example, Philippines would like to establish a national standard for GMO testing in the National <laughs> Control Services. Uh, how are we going to use this particular technology if possible? Maybe you can uh, link with Dr. Peng. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's easier to communicate APSA to him uh, instead of coming from me, okay? Thank you. Definitely, definitely. Thank, definitely. Thank I, uh, you. Yeah, your question is very great. Um, it's very good, Dr. Fisco. So and we, one more I, thing, Dr. May, I think for purposes of our members, uh, one, one thing which is uh, needed right now, uh, because uh, uh, GMO is, uh, of course, it's being used for corn, it's being used in Philippines and in, Viet in Vietnam. But for other commodities, my point is, the protection of our farmers in buying GMO or, or yeah, GMO seeds. Uh, they don't know if the seeds is really pure, genetically pure or not. So that can only be detected if we have the National Seed Quality Control Laboratory that we can use this particular uh, variety test, say uh, uh, th this particular uh, testing procedure that Dr. Peng Hai explained. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Dr. Peng Hai, we would like to thank you very much. Very uh, good presentation. And to me, it's uh, very fascinating to see the technology works also for you know testing the variety and also checking the counterfeit uh, variety. I think this is very important for the seed companies and the farmers. All right. Mm. Thank you very much, Dr. Frisco, uh, uh, for sharing the, the first half of the session. So we will, we will move to the online coffee break for five minutes and then we will come back again with uh, another two presentations, one from Mr. Michael Quinn and from our share to update the past activities. Okay, thank you. See you <laughs> later. Stay on.